2014 review of the current scheme between them Order, found Senator numerous Billig. benefits. Um, you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Some 437 First Nations people have died in custody since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. Will the government commit more resources to eliminating the overrepresentation of First Nations people in custody and eliminating deaths in custody? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong uh, for that important question. Uh, we are committed uh, to improving the lives of Indigenous Australians uh, so that genera this generation, the next generation and generations henceforth uh, can have the same expectations and opportunities as any other Australian. Uh, and we are committed uh, to taking effective action uh, to close the gap. And indeed, um, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, uh, uh, Ken White, uh, the member for Hazlack, is working very hard to help progress uh, those issues. But uh, th these are not straightforward issues. Uh, governments of both political persuasions, uh, at a state and at a federal level, have made genuine efforts uh, since uh, the first Royal Commission uh, um, report and recommendations were released some decades ago. Uh, but as uh, my friend and uh, colleague in Western Australia, the State uh, Labor uh, Indigenous Affairs Minister and Treasurer, uh, Ben Wyatt, said uh, on Sunday as I was at an event uh, with him in Perth, I mean, this, is, this has been a difficult issue for a very long time, and if there were easy and straightforward resolutions, uh, they would have long been applied because there has been a lot of goodwill uh, and a lot of effort put in place, as I say, in an entirely nonpartisan fashion uh, by governments of both political persuasions, both at the state and federal level. And yes, I mean, we are committed uh, to continue uh, to um, explore why is that we can do better. We must do better. We absolutely must do better uh, when it comes. Uh, to this uh, important issue. Uh, going forward, I mean, you'd be uh, aware of um, the announcement by the Prime Minister uh, in relation uh, to the uh, reform of um, national governance arrangements uh, and where the National Cabinet is replacing the Council of Australian Governments uh, from here on in, uh, and also the establishment of a National Federation Reform Council, uh, which will uh, meet um, together Order, with the Senator Cormann. Um, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Why has the government failed to commit to including child removal targets in the Closing the Gap refresh? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, the government is doing what we can to help progress, um, to, to help make progress in relation to closing the gap across a whole wide range of indicators. And as I was about to say, uh, once a year, the National Cabinet, the Council on Federal Financial Relations and the Australian Local Government Association will meet as the National Federation Reform Council with a focus on priority national federation issues, including and in particular closing the gap uh, and also uh, women's uh, safety. Task forces will be established to continue work on these priority issues. But there are no straightforward solutions here. If there were straightforward, uh, easy solutions, they would have been uh, implemented by now. Uh, we've got to continue to work hard to find better ways to make genuine progress in relation to what is a very important and legitimate issue. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Does Mr Morrison accept this is a problem that requires leadership from him rather than divisive comments from senior ministers? Will Mr Morrison work on a bipartisan basis to set strong and properly resourced justice targets, justice targets to eliminate the overrepresentation of First Nations people in custody and eliminate deaths in custody. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, any death in custody is a tragedy, and of course we uh, should work towards eliminating deaths in custody. And uh, the Prime Minister uh, and uh, my good friend and valued colleague, the Minister for Indigenous Australians, uh, Ken Wyatt. Uh, have demonstrated a willingness to work in a bipartisan uh, fashion uh, to address uh, those very important issues. I reject uh, the proposition of divisive uh, comments from senior ministers. I, I, I hear through your interjection that that is a reference to me and my comments on the weekend. Let me, let me, let me say to uh, Senator Wong that however legitimate the issue, however legitimate the cause, in the context of a pandemic, in the context of the many sacrifices that millions of Australians we are asked to make in recent months in order to save lives and save livelihoods. 
It absolutely was reckless and irresponsible to conduct mass protests of this night show Order. at this point in time. We are here. The, our mission Order. as a country and our responsibility as a country is Order. to avoid Senator a Corman, second time. Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer. Senator Wong, I'm calling the chamber to order. Senator Wong. Order. Order on my right and Senator left. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. How is the Morrison government extending support to help Australia's 3.5 million small and family businesses get through the COVID-19 crisis as the economy begins to reopen and recover? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. And as uh, we know on this side of the chamber, the government side, small and family business, they are indeed the backbone of the Australian economy. What we also know is the COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on small and family business and the Australian economy. Mr President, the Morrison government is committed to supporting Australia's small businesses as the economy reopens and the coronavirus health restrictions continue to be eased. The instant asset write-off gives small and family businesses the ability to improve their cash flow by bringing forward tax deductions. In 2017-18 alone, around 368,000 small businesses utilised the instant asset write-off to invest in their business. What this enabled them to do was to reinvest in assets for their businesses, including tractors, vans, equipment and machinery, tools, to name but a few, that are essential to helping their businesses to expand, grow and ultimately employ more Australians. As the economy reopens following the COVID-19 restrictions, schemes like the instant asset write-off will be crucial to giving these businesses the support that they need. And it's for this reason that yesterday the Treasurer and I announced that the government has extended the 150,000 instant asset write-off for six months until 31 December 2020. Australian businesses now, with an annual turnover of under half a billion dollars, will be able to take advantage of this extended time frame to support their businesses, to continue investment that they had planned and encourage them to bring forward investment to support their businesses to grow. Mr President, this of course builds on the substantial policy investment that the government has made in supporting our small and family businesses in Australia. Order. Senator Cash, Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. How has the government's COVID-19 economic response package helped small and family businesses to remain resilient and support their employees through this unprecedented economic crisis? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as Senator McLaughlin would be aware, the government has put in place a range of policies, targeted and proportionate measures to support both the economy but, of course, the backbone of the economy, small and family business. A total of $260 billion, and that's the equivalent to 13.3 per cent of our GDP, is being injected into the economy. And this includes the job keeper payment, which will support around 3.5 million workers, maintaining, of course, that important connection with their employer. Over half a million businesses are now accessing around $10 billion in assistance from the cash flow boost measure. Over 22,400 employers are being supported to retain almost 40,000 apprentices through our apprentice wage subsidy. And of course, around 13,500 businesses are receiving around $1.3 billion in loans through the SME Guarantee Scheme. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. What additional support is the government providing for small businesses in need of assistance as a result of the economic impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government has announced that it will be providing over $4.7 million to the Rural Financial Counselling Service to support small regional businesses facing hardship during COVID-19. This additional support, as Senator McKenzie is well aware, uh, for our regional communities is set to benefit hundreds of small businesses. What this funding will do is assist small businesses to access the immediate assistance they need to assess their financial position, 
identify their options and implement plans to keep afloat, improve their long-term financial viability and navigate that road to recovery. The government has also established a professional services fund to ensure businesses can access specialist third-party advice such as financial planning, specialist taxation, legal and accounting advice. And this, of course, is part of the assistance in terms of the government's $1 billion COVID-19 Relief Senator and Cash. Recovery Fund. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Mr Mark Sullivan, the chair of the Defence Honours and Awards Appeal Tribunal, wrote to the minister out of concern that she had misled the Senate in her statement on 13 May regarding ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan. Can the minister confirm that Mr Sullivan's letter said that the 2019 tribunal review found, and I quote, new evidence was presented and the tribunal found that the evidence provided to the British Admiralty was inaccurate and that it understated Sheehan's actions, and the tribunal determined that Sheehan fulfilled the criteria for the Victoria Cross for Australia. Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, thank Senator Urquhart for that question. Uh, Mr President, as senators know, in the last sitting period, I did make a, Senate, uh, a statement to the Senate in response to a question I took on notice from Senator Lambie regarding the matter of ordinary seaman Edward Teddy Sheehan. Since then, the Prime Minister has made a public statement, which I endorsed, uh, along with the long-standing advice from the Chief of Defence Force, which has also been made publicly. We appreciate that there is a view by some in this place and by others in Tasmania and across Australia that Teddy Sheehan didn't receive the recognition he deserved. Uh, now, order. Or Senator Reynolds, got Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, Mr. President, if the minister, can I just indicate, if the minister wishes leave to fully explain her misleading of the Senate, we will give her leave. Uh, uh, and we will give her leave at the appropriate time, uh, to immediately after question time. But this is not a question about the mislead per se. This is, a, this is a question asking the minister to confirm what Mr Sullivan's letter said. It goes to the subject matter of the mislead, not the process. And I'd ask the minister to be directly relevant to that issue. Um, on, on the point of order, I, I take the point by Senator Wong that the quotation was in reference to whether it was contained in a document that the question asked that the minister received. However, given that it was a long quotation, I'm going to give the minister some discretion to address that, but I do remind her of the first part of a very specific question, um, which asked about receipt of a document. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And had I been allowed to continue, I would have advised that I did come back to the Senate and clarify that statement. I clarified it. It was not misleading the Senate, and I've already addressed that here in this place. However, if uh, Senator Wong would allow me to continue, Mr President, I have some news Order. for the Senate on this matter. Order. So, uh, Order, Senator Wong. Yeah. I, Overturning a decision relating to a Victoria Cross nearly 80 years after Sheehan's heroic actions need compelling reasons. This is why the government's view and clear policy is that in consideration of the awarding of a retrospective Victoria Cross would only occur in light of compelling new evidence or if there was evidence of significant maladministration. Given there are different views on whether there is compelling new evidence about the Sheehan's actions in 1942, the Prime Minister has today commissioned an expert panel to provide him with advice as to whether the 2019 review by Order. the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal has indeed any new evidence not available to the previous reviews or otherwise available. And if that evidence is compelling enough to support a recommendation by the government that she has mentioned in dispatches is left. replaced by a Victoria Cross. Order on my left. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that Mr Sullivan's letter said that after the tribunal's findings were presented to the Minister for De Defence Personnel, and I quote, the minister advised me that he was comfortable with the recommendations and that he would be communicating with senior ministers, including yourself and the Prime Minister. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you much, very much, Mr President. Uh, as I have said, this matter was a, I did raise this matter in response to a question from Senator Lambie, and I did clarify that statement, which is available on the public record about that letter. But that was advice to government, and the Prime Minister has been very clear that the government did not accept that advice 
And as I have just said, in light of these differences of opinion, the Prime Minister—and I'll read out from his, uh, his press release—given uh, there are different views on whether there is compelling new evidence about Sheehan's actions in 1942, I have today commissioned an expert panel to provide me with advice as to whether the 2019 review by the Defence Senator Honours and Awards order, Appeal Senator Tribunal— Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you. Again, direct relevance, and I again reiterate, we'll give the minister leave to explain her misled at the conclusion of question time if she wishes. Senator Urquhart's letter goes directly to the content of Mr Sullivan's letter, which references Mr Chester's indication that he was comfortable with the recommendation and that that would be communicated with you. And she's asked, Senator Urquhart has asked, whether that, in fact, could you confirm that that is in the letter? Senator no, it's you, uh, with respect. No, sorry, well, sorry. I'm, sorry, I'm responding to the interjection. Um, asked and answered, she Senator hasn't Wong, answered. On the, point of, on the point of order, I'll take Senator Cormann. On, on the point of order, I mean, firstly, interjections are disorderly, but furthermore, um, repetitive, 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 repetitive order. points order. of order are also disorderly. Uh, and the minister could not have been more directly relevant to the question asked. It is not up to Senator Wong to determine how a question is answered. Uh, the standing orders require direct relevance, and the minister is directly relevant. Um, I, 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 I'll rule on the point of order when there's silence. I have ruled before that to be directly relevant, it must directly address material contained in a question or a preamble, or in this case, a quotation. I believe the minister was being directly relevant by, being, by directly addressing part of the question. I cannot instruct her how to answer a question. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I'll say for the o third order. time Senator, that I Senator clarified Wong, that so Senator on Cormen the record. On a point of order. Senator uh, Reynolds. I, I just make the point again: uh, interjections are disorderly, and leaders in this place ought to lead by example. Senator Wong, on the point of order. Uh, well, if he's making the point, uh, perhaps an example might be don't mislead the order, parliament. That's, um, <laughs> the points of order are not an opportunity for debate across the um, central table of the chamber. All senators are reminded that interjections are disorderly. I, would, I assume people would like to hear an answer. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as it's been asked and answered three times now, the matter that Senator Urquhart raised was answered by me uh, after question time to clarify the matter. It was not a case of misleading, but I did clarify one comment that I made. Order, However, Senator the bigger Reynolds, issue is what the, the Prime Minister has, has announced. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Morrison has overruled an independent review tribunal overruled the Minister for De Defence Personnel and forced a Cabinet Minister to mislead the Senate. Why is the government so determined to refuse proper recognition to the actions of ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Senator Urquhart. I'm sorry I laughed out loud then, but clearly you did not hear a thing I said about what the Prime Minister has announced today. I utterly reject— Order I utterly on my reject left. Order. The premise of your question. I did not mislead the parliament. However, let me let me read out. Order. You clearly did not listen to the Senator answer before. Urquhart. So the prime minister has announced today that, given there are different views of whether there is compelling new evidence about Sheehan's actions in 1942, I have today commissioned an expert panel to provide me with advice as to whether the 2019 review may, had any new significant evidence not available to the previous reviews or otherwise. So the expert panel will be chaired by the former Minister for Defence and former Director of the Australian War Memorial, the Honourable Brendan Nelson, and comprised the former Solicitor General, Mr David Bennett QC, former Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Peter Shergold, and senior creator and historian of the New South Wales Anzac Memorial, Mr Brad Manera. The panel will report to me Order. by the 31st Senator Reynolds, of July. Time for the answers expired. Order. Order on my left. Order on my right. I've, Senator Faruqi is on her feet. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Education in the Senate. Minister, free childcare has hugely benefited thousands of Australian families. While the package rolled out certainly had, it, had its faults and needed to be fixed, it was a signal that the government might start to recognise childcare as an essential service which should be free and available to all, not just those who can afford it. Returning to the old fee-based system will put enormous financial stress on families and limit real choices for primary carers who are overwhelmingly women. 
Why is the government plunging families into paying expensive childcare fees again, when just like public primary schooling, childcare should be free and universal? Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for uh, the question. The government absolutely accepts, accepts that childcare is important, and under the childcare reforms that our government instigated, uh, we saw, for example, workforce participation amongst Australian women reach record levels. We saw childcare fees uh, become more affordable as a result of the significant increase in investment that we put in place into the childcare system. Under our childcare subsidy, uh, that we are supporting the system to move back towards, the greatest level of financial support for childcare fees goes to Australian families who are working the longest hours but earning the least amount of money. That is the way, Mr President, that our government believes government spending should most appropriately be targeted, to give the greatest assistance to those Australian families struggling to go to work, struggling to pay their bills, to make sure they get the maximum assistance, in some cases all of their childcare fees paid uh, once the additional childcare supplements are taken into account, for many at least 85 per cent of their childcare fees paid. But for those families earning very high incomes, we believe it's not unreasonable that they pay some of those childcare costs. That, that is about how you make sure you run an economy where you can keep taxes as low as possible, to create as many jobs as possible for people to be able to access and target the revenue that you spend from those taxes to those who need it most. Now, I know the Australian Greens seem to think that there's a money tree and you can take all the money and you can make everything that you want to free and then you can ban other things and it has no consequence uh, to jobs in the Australian economy. But that's not the way the real world works. Higher spending necessitates higher taxes, which means a weaker economy and fewer jobs. That's not what we want. We want to make sure the spending is targeted to those who need it most Order. and that we can support Senator as many Birmingham. jobs as possible. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, a survey conducted by childcare advocacy group The Parenthood found that when childcare fees are reintroduced, more than half of households using childcare will have a parent forced to reduce work. And in more than two thirds of those households, the parent who will stop or reduce work will be a woman. How does the government justify this anti-women policy? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I'm yet to see a piece of credible work come from the Parenthood organisation. I've got to say, uh, the Parenthood, whose, uh, whose previous executive director I note was a Labor Party candidate at the last election, and who is largely funded by the trade union movement. So I've got to say, you know, their survey methodology is not one that I'm likely to take terribly seriously. The point, the point that Order. I would make. The point that I would make, Mr. President, is precisely the one that I made before. We overhauled the childcare system to provide additional investment and to better target it to make sure that we supported families to enable people to have the choice to go back to work if they wanted. And our reforms have worked. Our reforms ensured that as we went into the COVID-19 pandemic, we had female workforce participation at record levels in Australia. That we had driven up the number of Australian women working to record levels. And our determination is to use those same types of policy settings to get people back to work, not to be reckless in spending, Order, but Senator to be targeted Birmingham. to those who need Senator it. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Early childhood educators and care workers have been fighting for better wages and conditions, but the government has announced that it will scrap JobKeeper for the sector workers earlier than any other workers. This is an insult to their hard and vital work. Can the government guarantee that no childcare worker will be paid less under the transition package compared to what they are currently earning? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I can guarantee the transition package is a very generous proposition for the early childhood education and childcare sector, providing some $708 million in support for transition away from the emergency measures that were put in place put in place at a time where we saw childcare enrolments plummeting and therefore the viability of childcare services to stay open and offer care to parents under threat. We now see childcare enrolments back up above the 70 per cent mark. We're seeing families come back into the system. We think it's perfectly reasonable that those high-income families who can afford to contribute to the childcare fees ought to do so so we get back to assistance being targeted 
where it's necessary, but we also recognise that to transition from those emergency measures back to normality, extra support is required. That's why that $708 million calculated at 25 per cent of fee revenue will be provided to enable childcare services to do so successfully. Order. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how the Morrison government is ensuring defence's record investment and capability is continuing to support job creation for Australian workers to help us get through the COVID-19 crisis? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator O'Sullivan, for the question and also for your dedication to defence industry in our home state and right across this nation. Uh, this government's record in defence industry capability is playing an important part in our economy in four ways. Firstly, it's delivering the economic lifeline Australians need to get through the virus. Secondly, it's reopening our economy and our society for a clear road ahead. Thirdly, it's building confidence and momentum in our economy. And fourthly, it is contributing to positioning our economy for long-term growth. Defence is the Australian Commonwealth's largest employer. Defence also directly employs and engages over 120,000 Australians, 120,000 Australians. From this position of workforce strength and also stability, Defence is leading in its contribution of job creation and opportunities in this nation. And many tens of thousands more Australians across defence industry are now benefiting from this government's $200 billion investment in new ADF capability. And in naval shipbuilding alone, Mr. President, direct jobs will grow by over 2,500 over the next five years, growing to 15,000 new Australian jobs nationwide. In just two years, this government has already delivered six new Australian-built naval vessels, with another nine under construction, which is creating a pipeline of thousands of jobs which will continue to grow. Our Army Modernisation Program will create 1,800 direct jobs over the life of the Boxer and Protected mo at Mobile Fires program. The Morrison government is investing in our bases and training ranges Australia-wide, which is supporting local jobs in construction, maintenance, subcontracted work and supply chains. Through local industry capability plans for major construction contracts, around 80 per cent of all subcontracts are now going to local companies Order. right Senator across Reynolds. our nation. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how defence is assisting workers impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I'm very proud of the work defence and also Minister Price is doing to assist defence industry in this very difficult time. Defence has fast-tracked nearly $7 billion of invoices to Australian defence industry to help mitigate the impacts of COVID-19, particularly on their workforces. This is not only enabling Australian companies to retain their staff, but also to employ other workers who have been impacted by COVID-19. For example, Airbus Australia and Northrop Grumman Australia have taken on more than 100 civil aviation sector engineers and technicians to support maintenance and operations of our ADF aircraft fleets. The Naval Shipbuilding College is working closely with industries affected by COVID-19 to assist their workers reskill for careers in naval shipbuilding. To date, over 2,500 people have signed up to the Naval Shipbuilding College Workforce Register to undertake this training. And during this time, more than 300 Order. new companies Senator Reynolds, have time for the entered answer. the defence supply. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline how defence is continuing to provide job opportunities for young Australians by adapting its recruitment practices? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President. Indeed I can, Senator O'Sullivan. Defence is currently growing and reshaping its workforce to meet new and evolving capability requirements for our nation. And as I can personally attest, the ADF is an excellent career for young Australians who wish to serve, whether it be full or part-time. Defence has been incredibly agile throughout COVID-19, adapting its recruitment practices and procedures to allow for online testing and also selection. And between March to May this year, Defence Force recruiting applications are up by a staggering 35 per cent compared to the same period last year. The Defence Work Experience Program and our ADF Gap Year programs both continue to provide young Australians the opportunity to sample a career in defence. 
And defence is also attracting an increasingly diverse talent pool through Defence APS Graduate Program, the Indigenous Training Development Program and STEM undergraduate uh, cadetships, Order. all of Senator which are Reynolds. continuing. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last Friday, Mr Morrison was asked if he could guarantee that JobKeeper would remain until the end of December. He replied, and I quote, yes. Only three days later, the government announced that childcare workers would soon no longer be eligible for JobKeeper. Did Mr Morrison know this when he gave his guarantee on Friday, or did he decide to break his promise afterwards? Minister representing the Prime no, Minister, Mr. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pre uh, pr President. It won't surprise Senator Gallagher to hear me say I reject the premise of the question. But the Prime Minister's, <clears throat> the Prime Minister's statement uh, was and remains 100% accurate, and our announcement of a, a better, fairer, Order. more equitable transition for the childcare sector is not inconsistent uh, with the Prime Minister's statement. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Now that we are in a recession, can you guarantee that workers in other sectors will not have their access to JobKeeper removed? Senator uh, uh, th Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As the Prime Minister clearly indicated, the JobKeeper program is in place uh, until uh, the end of September. It's a six-month program which has been legislated for six months. Now, the childcare sector, in relation to the childcare sector, which is, causing, which is clearly causing these levels of disorderly interjections, uh, we have. We have come up with a better, fairer, more equitable way of providing transitional support in the context of a massive return of children into childcare, uh, in the context of, uh, you know, in the business, in the context of the business model of childcare services, our capacity to provide childcare subsidies, in the context of uh, higher attendance rates, in the context of parents, higher income parents being able to make a contribution to the cost of caring for their children, and indeed, uh, with a transitional uh, payment of $708 million across the, sector, across the sector, which comes with an employment guarantee across these childcare services. So, look, uh, and when it comes to the economic circumstances, Australia is in a challenging situation, but it is so much better than uh, just about anywhere else in the world. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary yes, question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Given it took Mr Morrison only three days to break his promise, why should other Australians trust that they won't also lose access to JobKeeper before September? Senator uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the senator would have been well advised to adjust her final supplementary in the context of the primary answer. Uh, I completely reject that premise. Uh, the Prime Minister's statement was and remains accurate. Was and remains accurate, and the JobKeeper program will remain in place, as the Prime Minister has stated, until the end of September. Uh, and I mean, beyond that, of course. I mean, I've already made very clear we don't have any other uh, proposals in front of us uh, to uh, in, in front of us. Uh, but there is a review. There is a review underway, which has been well publicised by Treasury, uh, which has been well publicised, and as we have indicated on, an, on many occasions now, we will be considering uh, the findings of that review uh, after it has been received by Treasury. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Order. Mr. President. Order on my left. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Happy birthday, by the way, Senator. My question relates to the live cattle export ban to Indonesia in 2011. This decision sent a billion-dollar industry, which employed over 10,000 Australians, into absolute chaos after the Labor government shut it down overnight because of left-wing activists. Can the minister outline to the Senate the steps the coalition government has taken to support cattle production in northern Australia? after the former Labor government's damaging Indonesian export ban in 2011. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Can I thank um, the Senator for her question and acknowledge the extraordinary importance of the live cattle industry to your home state of the Northern Territory and also acknowledge your extraordinary advocacy on behalf of the people, the farmers and the workers in that industry uh, through what was a tremendously terrible time for them following the decision in 2011 to overnight ban uh, live exports to Indonesia, a totally devastating act for that industry. But since coming to the office, this government has tried to provide that industry with the support that it needs to get back on its feet and to provide it with the confidence that it can have in its future. We've worked with the industry uh, to make sure that the rules are in place, that the markets are established, so that we can continue to grow this fantastic industry for Australia. 
and the government is absolutely committed to the future of this industry. Since coming to office, we have worked to strengthen our export markets and identify new market access opportunities. In fact, on 5 July, thanks to the tremendously hard work of the, the Minister for Trade, my colleague Senator Birmingham, the Indonesia-Australia Closer Economic Partnership Agreement will enter into force, a milestone, an absolutely major milestone in our trade relationship with Indonesia. And this new trade agreement is a win for the northern cattle farmers. It is also, from the first of this year, a win for all Australians when we see duty-free uh, cattle exported to Indonesia 575,000 head, increasing by 4 per cent every year to a total of 700,000 head. There will also be immediately halving of tariff on frozen beef meat uh, from 5 to 2.5 per cent and the elimination of tariffs over five years, opening up another market for your cattle farmers, Senator. So rather than taking a knee-jerk and damaging reaction that damages our relationship and tears down Australian farmers in the process, the Morrison government is committed to continuing to support this vibrant industry across northern Australia and is committed to it going forward. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate what the economic devastation is to livelihoods, communities and our trading partners when you recklessly ban an industry overnight? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, clearly um, the evidence that we have seen you know, for the Northern Territory Cattle, uh, Cattlemen's Association has put the damage bill of the 2011 decision at hundreds of millions of dollars, much of it felt in your home state of the Northern Territory. 700,000 head of cattle exported in 2009-10. 266,000 in uh, straight after the ban. 1,500 farm businesses affected by this right across northern Australia, and none more so than your home state of the Northern Territory. You can't shut an industry down overnight without impacting on farmers, on families, on businesses, on communities that rely on these industries. And the pain will always be amplified in rural areas. And as the former um, NTCA chief executive Tracy Hay said of the recent decision, this will forever be a warning to government that political populism and knee-jerk decisions are not acceptable in any context. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate the position of the government on appealing the live export trade class action? This sector desperately wants closure after nine years of pain following a reckless decision by the former Labor Agriculture Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, the decision was only handed down last week, um, and we have 28 days, obviously, to consider uh, the, uh, that decision. Um, and given the importance of this decision, um, it, and it is a very considerable issue, uh, and we will be taking our time. Um, the decision that was made was a terrible decision. There is no question about that. Um, and the effect that it had on the live export industry was absolutely enormous and unwarranted. Damage done not just to the industry but to many other people, industries and communities that rely on it. But as the uh, Attorney General said on the radio this morning, the government has a responsibility to ask questions about some of the legal principles that have been made by this quite unique decision. As the AG noted, one of the questions he is considering is whether or not lowering of the bar in this decision could actually be weaponised by animal activists against decisions which support the live animal export industry. I'm sure everyone on this side of the chamber would agree that this is a critically important decision to answer correctly. The government is proceeding with the live export Order. industry with our Senator farmers Rustin. front of mind. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. On Monday, the government announced it was going to force parents to start paying some of the most expensive childcare fees in the world. When was the minister informed? Did anyone ask the minister's opinion about the impact on women? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McAllister for her question. I obviously don't go into uh, matters of, uh, of uh, deliberation between uh, members of the cabinet, but. Uh, understand that uh, the uh, matters, uh, but the Senator can be assured that those matters, uh, as she has raised, are a decision of the government. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Yes. Women's workforce participation has dropped 50 per cent more than men's 
since COVID-19. Why does the Minister for Women believe that forcing more women out of the workforce through expensive childcare fees will help Australia recover from the first recession in 29 years? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And the senator can, tr can try to put words in my mouth, but she actually can't do that. And so you cannot assert that I said or believe something that I did not say. So let's start with that. And then let's let's acknowledge, Senator. Order. Let's acknowledge, Senator. And Order. you may not wish to because it does not suit your narrative. But let's acknowledge, Senator, that this country is dealing with one of the most extraordinary challenges in generations since the Second Order. World War. And what this government has Order done on my every left. step Senator of the McAllister. way is to take responsible and careful and considered steps about the way to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. That includes, Senator, starting from the base at which Australia's Australian women's workforce Senator participation was Senator at Keneally. its highest recorded level Senator under Watt. this government. We absolutely acknowledge that. We absolutely acknowledge Order the importance of that, and we absolutely Senator acknowledge Payne, the importance the time for the of addressing women's expired. workforce. But Order. Senator, on my left, I am having trouble hearing the minister's response. I don't like to have to talk over ministers to continually call the chamber to order. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Over 40 per cent of Australian families using childcare have had at least one parent's income reduced as a consequence of COVID-19. Did the minister advocate for those families to her colleagues? What does the minister say to families who won't be able to afford childcare after the government snaps back to the old high fee system. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I always advocate for the uh, for Australians in my work, no matter what part of my portfolio responsibilities we're talking about. But you know, Senator, and those opposite know that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has required extraordinary things of Australia and of Australians. It has required the government to put in place a temporary childcare package because we saw the sector facing unprecedented challenges that led it to the brink of collapse. And through those efforts, we have ensured that the sector is able to continue functioning and that childcare has been available for those who have needed it during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. But because we have made some considerable achievements, which we as a nation should be very proud of in flattening the curve, we have the capacity to see our life and our economy returning to normal. And the government will take considered steps in the response to that process as we need to, to ensure that we can rebuild our economy and Order. rebuild Senator our country. Payne. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. What initiatives has the Morrison government put in place to support young Australians impacted by COVID-19 crisis to get back to work? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson for his question. Uh, the Morrison government has invested billions of dollars in economic support measures to get Australians through the COVID-19 crisis and beyond, including JobKeeper payment, expansion of JobSeeker, early access to superannuation and direct fin financial support to families. As a percentage of GDP, Mr. President, Australia's investment is at the top of the leaderboard globally, showing that we are the best prepared as any other country. However, there is clearly a long road in front of us, and there will be no doubt further challenges in the road to recovery. As we enter the youth side, uh, the, the other side of this crisis, uh, young Australians will benefit from our commitment to returning the Australian budget and economy back to the strong and stable financial position that it was prior to the crisis to ensure that future generations do not unduly suffer from the economic Order. impacts of this crisis. Our Order. focus, Mr President, will be on practical Senator solutions that will benefit Australians to get back into or remain in work, including, including young Australians, now and into the future, including reskilling and upskilling the workforce, maintaining our $100 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline and, Mr President, cutting Order. red tape to reduce the cost burden on business and the economy and tax. Mr. President. This is in top, on top of our existing initiatives such as the Youth, Path, Youth Jobs Path, which will deliver 
real results for young Australians right ac across the country, including more than 93,000 young people who have participated, with over 58,900 getting a job as of March 2020. Mr. President, young Australians can have confidence in the coalition government. We have repaired the budget before, and we will do it again. And let's not forget about the 1.5 million jobs that we created since Order. the 2013 Senator election. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do. Uh, what additional assistance and training is the government providing for young Australians to develop their skills? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Patterson, for his supplementary. Mr. President, in his address to the National Press Club, the Prime Minister identified the need for our skills and training system to further develop and improve. We've embarked on a series of skills, or, uh, skills organisation pilots that are designed to give industry the opportunity to shape the training system to be more responsive to their future skills needs and to take responsibility for qualification development, which also will benefit young Australians. Three pilots have already been established, Mr President, in human services, digital technologies and mining, and they have already begun to show the benefits of this system. On top of this, Mr. President, the government is better linking funding to actual forward-looking skills needs based on what businesses need, simplifying the system and achieving greater consistency between jurisdictions and between VET and universities, increasing funding transparency and performance monitoring. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. What measures has the government put in place to help ensure that young Australians facing increased mental health challenges have access to the support and assistance they need at this time and into the future. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and access to mental health services for all Australians is one of the hallmark achievements of the Morrison government, and we continue in that vein. Yesterday, along, yesterday, along with Minister Hunt and Minister, Assistant Minister Landry, I was very proud to announce that the Morrison government will uh, invest an additional $24.2 million to reduce wait times and fast track access to mental health services for younger people aged 12 to 25, seeking headspace appointments. Uh, and this funding, funding includes $3.9 million to provide 12 primary health networks for capital improvements at 16 headspace services. $17.6 million will be provided to 17 PHNs to implement wait time reduction strategies at 28 headspace services. Mr. President, and $2.6 million will be provided to headspace network uh, national to support this work. And this builds on our $74 million package to support mental health and wellbeing for all Australians Order, impacted Senator by the Senator coronavirus. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Senator Rustin. I note that it's been 30 years, nearly 30 years, since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the Commonwealth Government. Um, has not been showing leadership in implementing these recommendations. I ask, is the government ashamed that at least 437 First Nations peoples have died in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission Order. and no criminal uh, convictions have been brought for any of these deaths? Order. I'm going to insist on order during questions being asked so I can hear them. The Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Seawa, for, for your question. Um, unquestionably, as a government, we have made it very, very clear that we want to work with the states and territories um, who have responsibility for the justice system to make sure that we deliver better outcomes for Indigenous Australians, and particularly to deal with the issue of incarceration and improve justice and community safety outcomes. We also want to make sure that we work with the Indigenous, Indigenous Australians, the Peaks and Indigenous people to make sure that we are delivering the outcomes that they so desperately want. There is no question that Australian, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are overrepresented in our adult and our youth justice systems, both as offenders and as victims. And, uh, this is seen upstream, particularly in the child protection system. But we also need to remember that Indigenous Australians are less likely to die in custody than non-Indigenous Australians. As the, Aboriginal, uh, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody found, the fundamental issue is that there are too many Indigenous Australians in custody too often. So it must go without saying that the most important thing— Order. Senator Seward on a point of order. I asked 
Is the government ashamed of that number of First Nations Senator, peoples who have died in custody? Senator Seward, I asked the minister Senator, to address Senator that particular Seward, issue. I remind senators that when questions contain lengthy preambles and assertions, and particularly language that can be challenged, a minister is entirely in order and has more discretion in being directly relevant in answering the question. Senator Seward, that was part of your question following a preamble. Senator Rustin is in order. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, Senator Seward, to your point, um, as, uh, as I think Senator Cormann um, mentioned in response to the question that he got earlier in question time from Senator Wong, uh, um, in discussions with uh, the Treasurer in, in Western Australia, Ben White, um, who acknowledges that if this was an easy solution, the solution would already been implemented. Senator, um, this is a very complex problem, uh, and it is going to require all Australians uh, to support the decisions that are made, not just of governments but of communities and of all Australians, to make sure that this all too often presentation of Indigenous Australians uh, in the justice system is reduced. Because, as I said, reducing the number of Indigenous Australians in contact with the justice system by addressing the underlying Order. factors. Order. Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Thank you. Is the government ashamed that First Nations peoples are the most incarcerated peoples in the world per capita? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, uh, Senator Seward, for your follow-up question. Um, it is quite clear that all Australians would like to see lower levels of Indigenous people in incarceration. In fact, we would like to make sure uh, that we have a system that, in, that encourages people uh, not to be encounter the justice system uh, in the first place. And that's why it is so important, particularly as it relates to Indigenous Australians, um, that we as governments, not just the, the federal government but the state and territory governments around Australia, um, engage with the peak organisations in the Indigenous communities uh, to make sure that we can define and clearly articulate targets and then work towards those targets to make sure that we do close the gap for the number of people, particularly rates of youth detention, as we all know, are tremendously high, but not just youth detention but adult, adult incarceration, because it is so important that we address this issue. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question? Yes, please. Why is it that The Guardian Australian is left to track deaths in custody? Why doesn't the government have a centralised mechanism in place for keeping track of deaths in custody nationally? Why aren't you doing it? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, the uh, one thing um, that I'd just uh, draw to the attention to uh, of the senator um, has been um, the, the, the federal government has made a large commitment in terms of addressing many issues around the closing the gap targets. Um, one of the things that has, uh, the federal government has, has offered to fund is a custody notification uh, service for each state and territory, so that we can make sure, so we can make sure that we are providing, firstly, culturally appropriate services to people who find themselves incarcerated, but also to make sure that the supports that they need and the support agencies that are able to provide those services are notified at an appropriate time to make sure that Indigenous people who are incarcerated are able to get access to those services. And so this, uh, this um, uh, custody notification scheme provides an important means by which to reduce the likelihood of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, deaths in custody by making sure that we're providing them with the appropriate services to support them should they find Order. themselves Senator Rustin, in jail. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Nadia Seavright was a young nursing student when Centrelink hit her with debts totaling $25,000. She was told by Centrelink she wanted to contest them, that she would need to pay lawyers to fight it in court, and if she lost, she might go to jail. Doctors suspect that the stress of interacting with Centrelink aggravated her autoimmune condition, causing her to be hospitalized on multiple occasions. Nadia even received calls from Centrelink when she was eight months pregnant. The government has conceded that the robodebt scheme developed by Mr. Morrison was unlawful. Does the government now accept that it was also wrong to illegally hound vulnerable Australians like Nadia? to the point of desperation. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, if people uh, fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, 
The government has a responsibility Order. to taxpayers to recover that money. Order. Order on my left. I'd like to hear the minister's answer, Senator Cormann. So uh, I, I hear the outrage. I hear the outrage Senator about Pratt. that quote. I hear the outrage. I hear the outrage. That is a quote not from anyone on this side of the chamber. That is Tanya Plibersek on the 29th of June 2011. Tanya Plibersek. If people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the order. government has Senator a Senator Cormann. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Relevance, Mr. President. I asked about the illegal robo-debt scheme designed by Mr. Morrison. He's quoting something that is predates, predates Mr. Morrison's illegal um, scheme. I draw him back to the point of the question and ask um, him to direct his answer I, to that. I, I'm happy to rule on the point of order. Um, Senator Keneally, the question had a substantial preamble. Um, the minister had, was 20 seconds in, and I could barely hear his answer. Well, I did hear the quote, the one you're objecting to. I'm listening carefully, but I do believe that is directly relevant to the substance of the question asked. He, um, Senator Cormann, to continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, further, the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. That is Bill Shorten. Bill Shorten. Now, now, and it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled Order. to repay their debt. Chris Bowen. Chris Bowen. Now, the government, Order. of course, has, has acknowledged. The Order government, on the my government, left. Order the government, on my left. Uh, the government has acknowledged that the uh, income averaging that uh, was used it was not an appropriate way to recover those debts, and that is why the government will commence refunding eligible debts from July 2020 and will continue through the 2020-21 financial order. year. Order, Senator but, Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, uh, point of order is direct relevance. The minister has been asked whether or not the government now accepts it was wrong. Sorry, Senator Rennett, would you like me to give you leave to speak? Order. Uh, fine. Interjections are always disorderly. Order. Inter I don't think anyone in the Senate has a halo on interjections. Everyone should cease them. Senator Wong. Order. Senator Wong. <laughs> I don't think. There's interjections coming all around the chamber here. As I said, no one has a halo. I would urge those who are well It's just always such an cease. interesting experience what he does. As if it's, uh, Senator, Senator Watt. Uh, Mr. President, this is, uh, this is um, uh, Nadia Sivrat is somebody whose case has been raised with the opposition. We are asking a question uh, about whether it was wrong to illegally hound vulnerable Australians like Nadia to the point of desperation. Now, I understand there's politics at play. The minister has had his, his fun quoting Labor people about a different scheme, but I would ask him to be directly relevant to I, that issue. She deserves an answer. Um, can I say on the point of order, um, I'm not in a position at this point in this chair to make a particular ruling on whether something or other was part of a particular program. The question asked the minister for particular information. In my view, the information he is responding to that with is directly relevant and does directly address the question. There is an opportunity to debate this particular matter after question time, and senators can avail themselves of that. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. As uh, Ms. Plibersek and Mr. Bowen says, the government have a responsibility to uh, recover debts where people have been overpaid. And as Mr. Shorten said, uh, the automation of this process will free up resources. But what I also uh, should say is that, of course, the government recognises that uh, recovery of debt has to be uh, done in a way that is lawful, and that is why the government has made the decisions that we've since announced. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Cancer-suffering grandfather Raymond Murphy had to sell his home and move into a shed just to afford medical treatment. He said that the debt collectors, and I quote, ripped him to shreds over a 2300 robo debt while he was in hospital does the minister think this was fair senator Cormann. thank you very much uh, mr president well it is always preferable for people to come to an arrangement uh, to settle their debts uh, that is absolutely preferable 
uh, but in, in the context of uh, people not engaging with uh, Services Order. Australia, in the context of people not engaging with Services Australia, that, it rises, uh, that rises administrative issues, which was uh, recognised when Labor, by Labor when Labor was in government. Now, uh, Order there were errors on my made, uh, in relation to the in relation to the automation uh, of uh, the income Senator compliance uh, program, and, and these will be addressed. And the government has made relevant decisions to address them. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. It's disappointing that the minister has neither addressed the situations of Nadia or Raymond. They are real people who have really suffered. So what is Mr Morrison's response to the human cost of the system he designed and implemented as social services minister in 2015? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the government seeking to uh, recover. Uh, outstanding uh, debts where there have been overpayments. I mean, that is something that has happened under governments of both uh, political persuasions and, indeed, the previous Labor government was considering the automation of this process. Now, having said this, well, and, and, and indeed Mr Shorten was, uh, was advocating uh, in favour of the automation of this process, that is a matter of public record. Now, these, these arrangements have to be put in place in a way that is consistent with applicable laws, and, and that is what we will ensure uh, will happen. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice plan. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, uh, Deputy uh, President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Cormann and Senator Payne to questions asked by Senators Wong, McAllister and Gallagher. Um, I, uh, Thirty years ago, the Royal Commission that I was part of uh, made recommendations uh, to the Parliament—339 recommendations. That commission had been set up by the Hawke government. Uh, and, uh, at that time, there were 99 deaths that we were concerned about in this nation to, to effect a national Royal Commission. Now we've got over 400 deaths since that Royal Commission. And we have 30 years that have passed that have not addressed the underlying issues that give rise to people being taken into custody and, consequently, dying in custody. So the social factors of health, housing, education, employment and the legal factors surrounding those have not been addressed in a manner to relieve this awful blight on this nation's history. And it's and there's a continuing pattern. There's a systemic pattern here, which I would appeal to the government and this new Butte system that the minister is believing is going to find the answers to it, this new Federation Reform Council, that this group of people actually look at the systemic approaches that take place. First Nations people are likely to come to the attention of police. We know that. The First Nations people who come to the attention of the police are likely to be arrested and charged. We know that. First Nations people who come to the attention of the police will be charged, but they will also be sent uh, to court. And when they go to court, what happens? They will be sent to jail. Now, this is a pattern, this is a paradigm that uh, is systematic, it's systemic, it's institutionalised. And if you look at this uh, from the point of view, of the, from the First Nations point of view, this is about the subjugation of the First Nations people. This is not about enlightened policy. This is about subjugating the First Nations people. You correlate that to the number of people who are being taken away, the number of kids who will be 30,000 kids in out-of-home care, and you, and you come up with a, which, oh, it's going to take time, it's complicated, and you know, it's really difficult. Well, it's not. Address the underlying issues, health, housing, education, employment and work with First Nations peoples uh, through the COAG uh, system or through the new system of the Reform Council, whatever it is, to actually set some targets, as uh, Senator Wong had asked, around these things for incarceration rates and for the diminishment of removing kids from, from uh, custody uh, or being, being can, uh, removed from their homes and put into custody uh, by, uh, in, in other families, which ultimately will lead to the adoption out of these kids. And I remind the government that the bringing them home report 
We will not analyse the policies and practices that pertain to that practices, those heinous practices, bordered on genocide. Bordered on genocide. So I, I ask you sincerely to make this a priority, a top priority, for too long. Nice words, good intentions, but the lack of action and commitment has not seen a reduction to the custodies or the deaths in custodies. It's seen an escalation in the social uh, indicators that diminish First Nations people and diminish us as a nation. It diminishes us as a nation because we are incapable of dealing with it. So I ask the, the government to sincerely put to, put to practice the best intentions into commitments and into, into real working and commitments with the First Nations peoples and get real agreements with the states. And don't pussyfoot around with the states say, oh, it's the state's responsibility. Well, we know this. You've been capable of finding ways of dealing with this. Now it's the time to stop the rot of First Nations dying in custody, being over imprisoned, and their children being put into out of care home. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, and I wanted to deal, uh, and I'd acknowledge uh, Senator Dodson's uh, contribution, but I did want to deal with uh, the question that Senator McAllister asked uh, in relation to childcare uh, and the changes to childcare. And I just wanted to go through uh, what those changes are, uh, the necessity of it, and, and to really, you know, it's great to get co contributions from. Senator Watt there, he's, uh, he's taken his orders from, from Albo and uh, he's got the phone call and he's still not on mute, but, uh, but I'll, I'll continue nonetheless. Uh, I'll continue. <laughs> no, you were hilarious, mate. <laughs> you were hilarious. We all, we, all, we, all had a, we all had a very good laugh. But, um, but on the more serious issue of childcare and the Labor Party's claims uh, when it comes to childcare, uh, let's deal with them. Uh, because what we dealt with in the childcare space and what we were dealing with was a once in generations crisis uh, that we had to deal with in a number of ways. Uh, first, we had to deal with stopping the spread, uh, and then we had to deal uh, simultaneously uh, with the economic fallout as we saw the necessary and important restrictions that were put in place to stop COVID from running rapidly uh, through our community, as we have seen in far too many countries around the world. So the emergency measures we announced for childcare, the emergency measures we announced for childcare uh, were never going to be the new normal. They were never going to be the new normal. And what we've heard from Senator McAllister uh, and others in their critique is that they don't want us to go back to our system of childcare support that this government has put in place. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, can't even, I can't even tell what the ridiculous heckling is at the back uh, from, from Senator Watt, but it is hard to hear myself nonetheless. But I will, I will persist, Deputy President. Um, when it comes to what we are doing in the childcare space, the argument from the Labor Party, and, and this is where, and, and it was backed up by the Greens, uh, you know, backed up by their, their Greens partners. Uh, is effectively that there is a magic money tree, uh, and once you put in place an emergency measure, uh, that emergency measure should be able to last forever. That is effectively the Labor Party's position and the Greens' position on a number of policy areas, including childcare. Now, when it came to childcare, uh, we put in place emergency measures. Uh, now, that dealt with the fact that there were less Australians, significantly less Australians, sending uh, their kids to childcare as the COVID-19 restrictions were in place. What we have seen subsequent to that, and subsequent to that, and this is something we should celebrate as a nation, Deputy President, we should celebrate the great strides we have made in recent times together as a nation in dealing with this crisis. We should celebrate the fact that we have not suffered uh, the kind of uh, negative health impact that so many other countries have. We should celebrate the fact that we are starting to see our economy open up far more quickly uh, than perhaps was anticipated a couple of months ago, and that as a result of that, people are getting on uh, with business. The economy is slowly starting to turn around. Uh, we know there is a long way to go to that, but more and more Australians are going back to work. 
And that is a good thing. And that is something that we in the coalition celebrate. Uh, we don't believe, as the Labor Party and the Greens do, uh, that government should be at the centre of economic life. We believe that government had a critical role, an absolutely critical role, and we believe we have and are fulfilling and will continue to fulfil that role for as long as it's necessary during these times of crisis to support Australians, to support Australian jobs, to support Australians' livelihoods. Uh, but what we're on about now is about growing our economy, getting people back into the workforce. The childcare system that we're returning to, the system of support, is one of the most progressive uh, sources of support that you could imagine. To have, to have subsidies of up to 85 per cent for low and middle income earners, which taper out as your income goes up. I mean, what could be fairer than a system that gives by far by far and by a significant length more support to low and middle income earners than what existed under the Labor Party. Under the Labor Party's system, uh, far less support was given to low and middle income earners, and we are delivering that. So the emergency measures that were put in place that the Labor Party would like to do, this goes to what they would do if they were to come into government. Bigger and bigger government, endless spending. Uh, we, have, we have engaged in the kind of spending that is needed to support our economy. We'll do it for as long as is necessary, you, but we should get our economy Your time going has again. Expired. Senator Billy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to take note uh, today, and I'm giving, uh, taking note on answers given by Senator Payne to questions about early childhood education. We know from uh, the COVID 19 pandemic that it has been disproportionate, has had a disproportionate impact on women in Australia. So the spin that's been put on, you know, we should all be celebrating over there by Senator Sazelda, I think, rings fairly hollow to uh, especially a lot of women in Australia. Women are more likely to have caring responsibilities and more likely to be working in insecure jobs. So it's a little surprise to Australian Australians that the government's policy response to this pandemic ignores this impact when the ranks of those opposite are, of course, dominated by men. It goes a long way to explaining why the gender gap in Australia is so high and why the Morrison's government is failing dismally to engage women in the workforce. It explains why women are disproportionately represented amongst those workers the government had left behind through their design of the JobKeeper scheme, such as casuals with less than 12 months' service with their current employer. Research by uh, the, group, uh, the advocacy group The Parenthood found that most Australian households currently using childcare will have a parent forced to reduce work when full childcare fees return, and in most of these households that parent will be a woman. And the same research found that over 40 per cent of Australian families using childcare had, had at least one parent's income re reduced as a result of COVID-19. So, Senator Sazilja did his bit of spin, but what he didn't point out was that the cost of childcare in Australia is, am is among the highest in the world. Childcare was already difficult enough to afford before COVID-19 hit, but now the families that are struggling financially due to the pandemic are going to struggle even more. The government's done no modelling, no modelling on the impact on parents of ripping away job heaper payment from the early childhood education and care sector. But their own review of the relief package finds that ending it three months early could put up to 86 per cent of services at risk of closure. 86 per cent of services at risk of closure. Now, as a former early childhood educator, let me just say that is abhorrent. That just frightens me because childcare is such an important issue. It's about access and equity. It's about making sure that people that don't have a high income can access childcare for the good of their child. It's not just about getting people back to work, to be honest. Yes, that's a large part of it, but children need social interaction with other children, and children from disadvantaged backgrounds must be able to have that um, access that they so desperately need to help them develop both socially and emotionally and even physically in a number of cases. So don't stand there and tell me how good you have been in regard to childcare. I worked in that sector for 12 years. I know that sector. And I've had many, many people through COVID from that sector um, approach me 
and talk to me about concerns they've got regarding uh, JobKeeper, regarding, and especially this week regarding the flip-flop where Mr Morrison, within 48 hours, said JobKeeper will remain and then, oh, well, except for you know, early childhood educators. You know, we know what you guys on that side think of early childhood educators. It's been in Hansard what people on your side think about early childhood educators. Let me say, they are some of the most dedicated workers in this country, and they take the responsibility of looking after people's most prized possession, their child, very, very seriously. And for this government to actually have a review of the relief package and find that ending it three months early could put up to 86 per cent of services at risk of closure is abhorrent. Many providers were already struggling because the government's free childcare announcement wasn't properly funded, but the snapback is going to make the situation even worse. There will be a snap all right, let me tell you. It will be the snap of the doors closing on some of these early childhood education um, providers. While the government hasn't modelled the impact on parents, the modelling that has been done by others does paint a very grim picture. A survey of 1,300 parents conducted by advocacy group The Parenthood, as I said, found that more than um, a third will be forced to reduce days or remove their children from Thank care you, altogether Senator Billick, when we your snap time back has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And, uh, I have to, uh, find it quite odd for Seneca, Senator Billick to stand there and say, don't you tell me hmm? oh, Deputy President, sorry. Don't you tell me about childcare. Well I'm sorry, but I stayed home and raised my children for four years. And that was a conscious choice because I realised how important it is for children to spend time with their parents when they are young. And there is no greater bond. What's that sorry? Take it on notice? Order. What kids? Yeah, between the ages of zero Order. and four, absolutely. I it's remind, something. Just a moment, it's Sen something Senator Rennick. Just a moment. I remind senators in the chamber to direct their comments to the chair, and I remind other senators that interjections are disorderly. Please continue, Senator Rennick. Thank Renick. you, Madam Deputy President. Yes, ideally it would be great if a parent could stay at home and raise their children in the early years between zero and three. Because, as I said in my maiden speech, there is no greater bond between that of a child and a parent. Well, that's not your call. That is not the call of the senators here in this chamber. That is the choice of the parent. It is not a choice of the government. And that's the difference between the people on this side of the chamber and the people on that side of the chamber. They want the government to step in to the classroom, the family home, the bedroom and tell everyone how to live their personal lives. No, 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 no. We live in a Western democracy where we respect individual rights and individual freedoms. Okay? And we do not want the hand of government reaching in and taking away our children's youth. Now, at the end of the day here, what we can see here, what I love about Labor, they always make out how they care about the children. This isn't about the children. This is about Labor increasing their union membership. Okay, at the end of the day, you never hear Labor talk about raising the pension, do you? Because they don't want superannuation, the pension, to replace superannuation, which is all about, which is all about looking after their rivers of gold in the superannuation fund. So the, the, the only part of the union movement that's actually growing uh, is the childcare industry, and that's why you're pushing it. Because at the end of the day, if you can keep a child at home, if you can keep a child at home, and if you can keep a parent at home. You're going to halve the congestion on the roads. You're going to half the pollution, and you're going to increase. You're going to increase the quality of life for their young children and the parents. Order, order. That is a choice. Order. Now, what we would like to do, what we would like to do, is to provide a choice. And let me tell you something. Dorothy didn't tap her shoes together and say that there's no place like childcare. She said there's no place like home. And I can guarantee you when people grow up they don't pick up the phone and call their childcare uh, the, the, uh, uh, guardian when they were at childcare 20 years ago. They talked to mum and dad. And this party will always stand up for the rights of the family and will always try and encourage a bond between the child 
and the parent. So, uh, yeah, yeah, Order. sure, okay. Yeah, great, because you guys know. Order. Any, you know, yeah, yeah. Order. So, now I just want to address uh, the issue here of uh, deaths in custody. Um, now, obviously, there has been an increase uh, in the number of Aboriginals uh, uh, incarcerated, so what we need to do there is and try and close the gap. And I think it's worth noting, and it's something that hasn't got a lot of talk but I've, uh, mentioned, but I think it is worth noting that the a port, report by the Productivity Commission found that state and federal governments spend $33.4 billion on services for Indigenous Australians to help try and close the gap. Okay, now that works out at $44,000. Uh, for every Aboriginal Australian, compared to $22,000 for every non-Indigenous Australian. So I do think that there has been a genuine attempt by governments at all levels to try and close the gap. Uh, so, um, and the other thing I think we need to point out as well is that people often quote these homicides, uh, 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 sorry, the, the deaths in custody as though they're homicides. And it's important to note that the deaths in custody doesn't mean to say that they were killed in custody. The biggest cause of uh, deaths in custody was from natural causes. The next one after that was suicides. The next one after that was accidental. And then there were uh, there were deliberate uh, unlawful homicides, which is obviously still too many, of six, uh, six in uh, pl uh, prison custody, and eight in police custody. But can I say I have a friend who works in uh, a, a watch house, and they have to actually check on the prisoners every 15 to 20 minutes. So there is a genuine attempt at looking after the, the prisoners. I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying everyone gets it right all the time, but I really don't think that we should be inflaming this situation uh, by playing uh, needless identity politics, which Senator Wong was doing before. Uh, I thought it was Thank quite you, tawdry Senator and Thank you, Senator. I think your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And uh, It certainly does seem that Dorothy has, in fact, tapped her shoes uh, in the Senate today. Uh, with comments uh, from those on the government benches uh, that would send Australian women right back to the 1950s, where apparently this government believes they belong. And this is a government that is no friend of the women of Australia. The government's snapback uh, is apparently starting even earlier than expected, and it is a snapback that will hurt the women of Australia. Only on Friday did the Prime Minister guarantee that workers would be able to count on JobKeeper payments until September. And then three days later, on Monday, he announced that JobKeeper would in fact end for 120,000 early childhood educators. The Prime Minister's commitment did not even last the long weekend. Uh, and now they've not ruled out making further adjustments to the JobKeeper program. Uh, and after that backflip on Monday, further adjustments could mean anything. It could mean removing more workers from the scheme because you cannot trust a word that this government says. Are they really on the side of Australian working women? Are they really on the side of the Australian workforce? They've already excluded millions of casuals and temporary migrant workers from JobKeeper. We have Liberal members of parliament calling for an early snapback day after day. Now it's early childhood educators. Who is next? Who is next in the government's sights? Now, early childhood ed educators have been absolutely on the front lines of this crisis. They are essential workers who have been absolutely critical in allowing other essential workers to stay at work. And to reward them by being the first to have support withdrawn is an absolute slap in the face to those women workers of Australia. 97 per cent of early childhood educators are women. Uh, and they have done absolutely everything that this government and this country have asked of them over the past few months. They've turned up to work when others have stayed home to stay safe. And they've done that with absolutely no ability to practice social distancing when educating, yes, educating small children. They've been deemed to be essential, except in their pay packets, where of course they remain some of the lowest paid working people in Australia, exactly because of the types of attitudes that we've heard from the government benches today about their incredibly important and essential work. 
This is a group of people that has faced huge uncertainty about the future of their jobs and the future of their sector. And now they are the first, the first to be booted off the JobKeeper payments by this government, who just said, who just said that no one would be kicked off before September. What a way to thank the early childhood educators of Australia. And now the government is ending free childcare as well, right at the time when we are in the middle of a crisis. And ending both the free early childhood education program and JobKeeper for those early childhood educators is going to cause huge problems for so many Australian women and so many families. Um, returning to unaffordable childcare and removing access uh, is going to make the return to work even that more difficult uh, than it is already um, uh, being today for so many working families. So at a time when we are in recession and at a time when parents need to be able to return to work and at a time when households are struggling, how will ending the free childcare package help? How will it help? We know that it won't. There's been research published this week uh, that says that ending the childcare rescue package early is going to force parents in 60 per cent of households to reduce work. 60 per cent of households to reduce work. Uh, and of course, in the majority of cases, in the majority of cases, it's going to be women who have to stop or cut back on their work. So this government is delivering a triple blow to the women of Australia. First, three days after guaranteeing JobKeeper, the government has ripped it out of the hands of almost 120,000 women educators. Three days after they guaranteed it. Three days. Then, at the same time, it ends free childcare at a time of massive hardship, of recession, when women need to be able to work. This government does not have the backs of Australia's working women. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dodson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Siwa, I presume you and Senator Faruqi are speaking on the same matter. If not, Senator Faruqi will have to explain which matter she's okay. following. Okay. Thanks. Um, we're speaking on different matters. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I rise to take note of the answers from Senator Rustin to my question on uh, deaths in custody of First Nations peoples. And, obvious, and I asked, is the government ashamed? Is the government ashamed of the fact that 437 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have died in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission report? 437. Australia has the highest rate of incarceration of First Nations peoples per capita in the world. Is the government ashamed of that? Apparently not. And when I asked about is there a process of recording uh, that centralised process across Australia? No, there isn't. Well, there isn't because there was no answer to that either. And that is symptomatic of the problem that exists in this country, a failure of governments to address the issues of the cause for, for why First Nations peoples end up incarcerated, because they aren't changing the record. They aren't changing the, the drivers for people ending up in custody, and they're not then holding people responsible for those deaths in custody. Not one conviction for any of those deaths in custody. Now, what we need to be doing is change the record, and change the record, the organisation that has been tracking this issue around justice for First Nations peoples also are articulating what the government should be doing. In other words, across Australia, repealing the punitive bail laws, which is why people end up in prison. Getting rid of mandatory sentencing. How much more evidence does this mob need to know that this is leading to First Nations peoples being discriminated against, ending up and contributing to them ending up in prison? Ending things like uh, public drunkenness, criminalising public drunk drunkenness. They should be decriminalising that. Making sure, making sure that children don't end up in prison. For too, far too long, these governments have been, uh, governments across Australia have been obfuscating the fact that we need to be addressing the fact that this country is locking up children. We need to be ending racist policing and requiring police accountability on these issues. 
and we need to be making sure we genuinely implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Because I can tell you what, that report that was tabled a couple of years ago—in fact, it wasn't tabled. It was forced to be required to be tabled in this Senate because it was not released in public through an order of production, doc of production for documents, found supposedly that two-thirds of those recommendations have been implemented. But if you actually read the report, and in estimates we actually finally dragged the information out of the, uh, the bureaucrats, that in fact it was a desktop survey and they couldn't track the information. This is a travesty. The government should be ashamed of their record. The question is the motion moved by Senator Sewell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the minister's responses to my questions on early childhood education and care. I was deeply disappointed, but not entirely surprised, to see free childcare scrapped by this government after just two months. Ending free childcare is a huge mistake. Thousands of families have been hit hard by the COVID-19 crisis and now have to make some very hard choices. Many stakeholders have come out to express their shock and disappointment with the transition package, the scrapping of JobKeeper, or the end of free childcare. And these include centres, peak bodies, parent groups, and the union movement. Australian childcare fees are some of the highest in the world. We need a radical revamp of the whole system, and it starts with looking at how we make childcare free for good. Childcare is an essential service. In our patriarchal society, the caring work has long been seen as women's work and undervalued, creating the heavily casualized and underpaid conditions for so many workers in childcare and early learning. And this is not an accident. The entire system, our entire economy in fact, relies on the unpaid and unpaid work of women in caring roles and the skilled, difficult work done in childcare centers is too often seen simply as an extension of it. Making childcare free and well-funded and supporting carers and educators is essential to dismantling these retrograde ideas. Ending JobKeeper for early childhood educators and care, well before all other workers in Australia, is unfair in the extreme, and most of these are women. Free childcare combined with decent wages and conditions for workers and educators are essential to building a system that is fair for all. And while there were clearly issues with the scheme that has run since April, these could have been fixed by widening JobKeeper eligibility and raising the subsidy for centres as enrolments increase. Instead, the government has taken the easy way out, despite finding $60 billion down the back of the couch just a couple of weeks ago. The Greens and I will do everything we can to show the government just how essential early learning and care is. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Theravanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for 13 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the export control sheep meat and goat meat export to the European Union tariff rate quotas, Order 2019. Thank you, Senator Theravanti Wells. Uh, if there are no further notices of motion to be given, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McCarthy for Wednesday the 10th of June to Thursday the 11th of June 2020 for personal reasons and for Senator Brown for Wednesday the 10th to Friday the 12th of June 2020 and Senators Mario Smith and Polly for Wednesday the 10th to Thursday the 18th of June 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it.